Nice to be with you today. Um, we'll probably get to about 2006, and then I'll say, and everything else you know <laughs> since then, uh, which isn't really true, but I'll sort of summarize the last 15 years in literally a sentence or two, because I think that since 2006, we've been living in a reality with which we've all become familiar and which broke definitively on October 7th. Um, and everything since October 7th, we're now living through history. We're living through what is, I think without a doubt, the most consequential chapter in the history of the Jewish people in my lifetime. Um, and in the lifetimes of a number of the people in this room, uh, previous to 2023, I would have said that the defining moment was 1995, and we'll talk about why. We're going to cover that period today. Previous to 1995, um, Yom Kippur War, which is where we'll begin our study today, but probably the moment we're in now is the most consequential for the Jewish people since the twin uh, episodes of the Shoah and the establishment of Israel as an independent state. So really, 1933 to 1948. And there are people in this room who lived through at least part of that period. Um, maybe there are a handful of people in this room who actually remember the founding of the state of Israel, um, but the majority do not. You're either children or not alive. Um, so anyway, just something to think about. Uh, my teacher, professor, and friend, Yehuda Kurtzer, who is the uh, director of the Hartman Institute, an incredible organization, um, spoke at a local home in Scarsdale on Thursday night. I had the privilege of hearing him, and he said, we do not get to choose the moment of history in which we live, but we do get to choose how we will respond. And so the shaping of our response to this moment will become, I think, the defining feature of Jewish life, both for Israelis and for American Jews. Of course, there are Jews outside of both America and Israel, but 14 fifteenths of the world's Jews live in either Israel or America today. So this is an incredibly important defining moment, and it will all rest on how we respond. Um, two other things to say. Uh, the Jewish people lost a giant among us this week um, in the peaceful passing of Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, Zichrono Livracha, who died at age 76 in his sleep on Tuesday night and whose funeral is being observed right now, uh, Wednesday night rather. His funeral is being observed right now, and I'm grateful that Cantor's Sonnet Asor and Cantor Kleinman are both at his funeral representing Westchester Reform Temple. Dr. Ellenson was born into a modern Orthodox Jewish home in Norfolk, Virginia, a place where he may have left with his feet, but not with his heart, um, often referred fondly to Jewish life in Norfolk. Um, he brought an incredibly expansive sense of Judaism, Jewish responsibility, Jewish history, and Jewish intellect to all of his work as a rabbi and as a teacher. For many years was beloved faculty at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. That is the training ground for all reformed Jewish clergy and other Jewish professionals, my alma mater. It is the alma mater of every other clergy person you've ever met at WRT who's worked here. Um, he went on at a very uh, difficult time following the resignation or the firing of HUC's previous president in a uh, scandal to, after an interim period, assume the leadership of HUC in 2002 as its president and served as president until the election of Rabbi Aaron Pankin, also of blessed memory, uh, who died in 2018. So David Ellenson served as president from 2002 to 2013 when Rabbi Pankin was elected to the office and remained in the role as chancellor and actually stepped back into that role as acting president when Aaron was killed. Uh, so, David Ellenson, what can I say? Just a gorgeous human being, an extraordinary scholar and teacher, my friend. Uh, he preferred to be called David, so I'll share my favorite David Ellenson story. 
Um, he and I had the privilege of co-officiating at the wedding of two young rabbis, Rabbi Samantha Shabman, who grew up at WRT and really grew up in this room here at Sharing Shabbat, um, and her then fiance, then husband, uh, Natan Trief, who met in rabbinical school, and they asked for Rabbi David Ellenson and me, little me, to co-officiate at their wedding. And as David and I were approaching the chuppah, he gently put his arm around my shoulder and whispered in my ear. He said, Jonathan, someday I knew we'd be walking down the aisle together. <laughs> so I'd like to dedicate this morning's study to the memory of Rabbi David Ellenson, truly great historic figure in American Jewish life, and his teaching will continue to inspire generations of our people. Okay, deep breath. I've, I've now finally caught my breath. <laughs> um, last week, we made it to just on the, like, the eve of the Yom Kippur War. We talked about the other wars that had shaped the geopolitics of the region, and we talked about the rise of Palestinian nationalism within Israel-Palestine, and we talked about, we ended actually with a couple of important uh, features in history. One was uh, Black September, September of 1971, when King Hussein of Jordan cracked down on the PLO, on Palestinian mil militants, uh, killing thousands and forcing the Palestinian, uh, the PLO leadership to relocate uh, to Lebanon, which is importantly sets the stage for a lot of the material we're gonna cover today. And we also talked about the uh, infamous Arab League meeting in Khartoum, Sudan in 1970, where, where's Steve Saba? Is he with us this morning? Thank you, you remembered this, the three no's, right? No recognition of Israel, no peace, no negotiation. So um, this was an important demonstration of the kind of shared mi mindset or shared political decisiveness of the whole Arab world not to recognize Israel. Something, which I said, really began to change only at least publicly under the Abraham Accords starting just a couple years ago in 2018, uh, 19, during the, the Trump administration and of course the long tenure of Netanyahu as prime minister. Leading up to the Yom Kippur War. So remember, uh, summer of 72, Munich Olympics, the massacre of 11 Israeli athletes, all part though of a years-long trend of Palestinian uh, terrorism as a tactic for resisting uh, the existence of the State of Israel. Um, they might have used the word occupation, but it was clear that the PLO uh, resisted the existence of the state. So, as Ari Shavit says, um, it's about 48, not about 67. Now, so, you can kind of process what that means, and it is shorthand for a dilemma that I think exists even today. Um, there's a lot of uh, wars of words taking place, and when Palestinians talk about occupation, it is I believe both appropriate and necessary to ask anyone who is either defending the Palestinian position or expressing the Palestinian position, when you talk about occupation, are you talking about 67, which is when Israel conquered the, or took as spoils of war effectively, um, it won the West Bank, Gaza, and the Sinai. This is all recap from last week. We actually covered this history. Um, and any negotiated peace uh, attempt since then, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the peace process today, that's a big part of what we're covering, uses 67 as the kind of boundary between the Israel before 67 and the Israel after 67. So when you talk about territorial trades or concessions of land for peace, it's always about land that was acquired in 67. And we're gonna get to what happened in, for instance, the late 70s when Israelis and Egyptians actually demonstrated kind of as proof of concept that land for peace can work. And that has influenced every subsequent peace process between Israel and both neighboring countries and with the Palestinians. We'll see if the proof of concept is still true today. Leading up to uh, 1973, 
Um, Nasser is now no longer the president of Egypt, and Sadat, who had served as a vice president in a few of his administrations, but who had broken away from his party, succeeded him. Determined to restore the badly wounded pride of Egypt, now having lost not one major war against Israel, together with its Arab allies, but two, the Sinai in 56 and the Six-Day War in 67, also, these wars having precipitated a terrible economic downturn in Egypt. So Egypt is really going through it. And Sadat basically says, starting when he comes to power in the early 70s, it is my first, foremost, and only responsibility to restore Egypt to glory, um, or at least to recover from our badly wounded pride and our badly hurting economy. Um, as part of this objective, he comes to the determination that the best way to do this would be by launching an offensive against Israel. And believing he would be more effective doing this in partnership with Syria than doing it alone, he teams up with Syria's new president, Hafez al-Assad, to reach a kind of general agreement by March of 1973. Uh, so this is uh, six months before the Yom Kippur War, a little bit more, six, seven months, uh, six months before I was born. Um, uh, September of 73 is when I came around. I was born 16 days before the Yom Kippur War. That's how I remember it. Um, they would join, yeah, you're laughing because you weren't around then, but when I tell that to the kids in my confirmation class, they laugh because I'm so old. You know, so, it's all about perspective. Um, so without specifying details, Sadat and Assad decide they're going to launch an offensive against Israel in the spring. Because remember, Syria is also licking its wounds post-67 and has been for a long time. One of the spoils of the 67 war was the Golan, which has been a strategic hedge against Syrian aggression. We talked about Syria actually encroaching and diverting water against the agreement that had been reached after 67. So Syrian belligerents to the north, Egyptian belligerents from the south. In the spring and summer of 73, Egyptian forces begin very easily observable military exercises all along Israel's southern border. And Israel, what can we say about Israel? In the, in the book by Daniel Gordis called Israel, A Concise History of a Nation Reborn, which is really a wonderful primary source overview, covers virtually all the material that I've prepared for this class, and much, much more, because it really also gives you a wonderful window into the domestic picture. I'm focusing largely on Israel in relationship to its neighbors and the Palestinians. So the conflict, because the name of this class was A History of Zionism and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Um, but he talks a lot about the Hebrew word concepcia, which is just a, a Hebraicized English word, conception. Israel's self-conception or perception of invincibility post-67. We talked a lot about this psychic impact of the incredible, swift, decisive victory after 67 and what it did to Israel and how it actually moved a significant, though we can say minority, extreme part of the population toward a, an expansionist settlement movement in the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan but especially West Bank and Gaza, especially, especially West Bank, both nationalistically and religiously motivated settling in these territories that were taken in the war, as well as further amplifying already growing Palestinian militantism and extremism. So it really fueled two different movements that were, in my view, amplified division right, led to a situation that today is much more difficult than it might have been to address in 1968. Um, nevertheless, Israel persists under this conceptia or impression of its own invincibility, and this becomes a common theme in how the 1973 war is analyzed and understood, particularly by Israelis, both the, the Israeli street, meaning the, just the population, but also historians who look at this. It's very interesting. The Yom Kippur War is the most studied war 
by military strategists. It is actually considered to be the most important class at West Point, is learning about the Yom Kippur War. In that context, it is generally studied because it exemplifies how, despite an intense drubbing in just the first few days of the war, Israel, I mean, really, Israel looked like it was on the precipice of military defeat. And the way in which over the next two and a half to three weeks, Israel turned the game around and actually won a significant military victory, that's how the Yom Kippur War is taught outside of Israel. Inside of Israel, it's a very different story. Yom Kippur is a wound that does not heal, largely because of what happened in the f first few days and the way in which Israel was caught off guard. And that is why so many people who analyze these things for a living are using comparative frames to, discu to discuss October 7th. Because in many ways, the impact to the psyche of Israel was even greater than the body count, though the body count was awful in both cases. And where exactly it's going right now, of course, no one knows. I don't know anyone who takes Israeli military history seriously, who thinks that Israel will be or can be defeated militarily, but the psychic impact has been devastating. And, and the devastation on the Israeli psyche will, will all, by all accounts persist for as long as anyone who lived through October 7th is alive. And, and, and I'm sure well after. Um, so Israel's leadership, which includes in 1973, Prime Minister Golda Meir and Defense Minister Moshe Dayan, they kept missing signs and missing opportunities of what was happening on the southern border, refusing to prepare for war. Even after Prime Minister Hussein, uh, sorry, King Hussein of Jordan makes a secret visit to Jerusalem in late September 1973. We're talking days before the Yom Kippur War. He comes to uh, Jerusalem in secret to tell Golda Meir that the Egyptians and the Syrians are planning to attack Israel, and they still didn't launch a preemptive strike. Um, and some of this is also they were advised not to. Kissinger, um, <laughs> complicated figure for the Jewish people, nevertheless, uh, I think what Blinken said, like, never has one person exerted, a, you know, a stronger influence on the course of history than Henry Kissinger, I think that is actually a demonstrable claim, and that's a paraphrase, not a direct quote, but I think I captured the essence of it that was spoken just hours after his, the announcement of his death. Um, Kissinger also advised, you know, don't, uh, don't do anything here. Um, and so Israel uh, did not. Even after observing that Soviet advisors left Egypt and Syria on the 4th and 5th of October, which was another ominous development that Israeli leaders knew about but ignored. So the Yom Kippur War is launched on the 6th of October, 1973. And just co by comparison, because we know we're in uh, what is today like day 65 of the war in Gaza, um, the Yom Kippur War lasted only uh, 19 days, from the 6th to the 25th of October. Um, it is a war between Israel and a coalition of Arab states led by the uh, dual attack, as had been planned and discussed by Egypt and Syria. The majority of the combat between the two sides, or between Israel and its uh, adversary to the north and to the south, takes place, respectively, in the Golan, in the northern part of Israel, um, or what Syria claimed was its territory captured in the 1967 war, and the Sinai Peninsula, also captured and militarily occupied by Israel since 67. So for, you know, six years and more, six and a quarter years, Israel had been in the Golan and Sinai, and that's where most of the belligerence takes place. Uh, an Arab coalition jointly launches its surprise attack against Israel on the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur, which also happened to be the 10th day of Ramadan. How many of you remember where you were when the Yom Kippur war was launched? Right. The number, were you in shul? Were you in synagogue? Does anyone want to just share a sentence or two about what it was like? Thank you. I saw you and Audrey both indicated you were like right here at Westchester Reform Temple. But you weren't in the CJL because it hadn't been built yet. <laughs> Still 20 years before this building was built. Um, Audrey? Yeah, right. 
Um, yeah, I yell it. You were an infant. You were a baby. You, do, you remember going to a shelter? Probably one of your first memories. Wow. Was, was your father called up? Of course. She says it like it's nothing, but for an American audience, it's actually a fact that has to be... I knew the answer would be yes. <laughs> yes, of course he was, because that's Israel. Jason, did you have your hand up to you? You're just arm around your wife. <laughs> okay. Um, following the outbreak of hostilities, and this is a really important theme to understand, the United States initiates massive resupply efforts for Israel, and the Soviet Union initiates massive resupply efforts for its Arab allies in the Middle East. And so what we see here is the way in which by the 70s, Israel had actually become a proxy for larger geopolitical conflicts between the two great superpowers, which then, of course, were the USSR and the US. And this had really been going on since Nasser and the Sinai War, but you see it fully in this moment. Fighting commences when Egyptian and Syrian forces cross over their respective lines, the ceasefire lines that had been established post-67, entering the Sinai and the Golan. Egyptian forces easily crossed the Suez Canal, advanced all the way into the Sinai. The Syrians, in their coordinated attack in the Golan Heights to coincide with the Egyptian offensive, initially made significant gains into the Golan. I mean, they just overran Israeli installations in the Golan. Has anyone ever seen the uh, miniseries, I think it was on Netflix or HBO Max, uh, called Valley of Tears? You must go watch it. And it really, it, it deals with these first few days of the war and how devastating it was for Israel. I mean, the losses were huge. Um, just to kind of summarize what happened, after three days of heavy fighting and really significant Israeli uh, casualties, Israel manages to first halt the Egyptian offensive, which kind of results in a military stalemate on the Sinai front, and pushes the Syrians back to the pre-war ceasefire lines, and then keeps going. And this is part of why it's taught at West Point, um, the way in which Israel turned around what looked like possible or sudden defeat into what eventually became a victory, again, in just in under three weeks. It launches a four-day-long counteroffensive. this is Israel, deep into Syria, and within a week, Israeli artillery begins to shell the outskirts of Damascus. So this is how swiftly Israel was able to turn it around, but, and you would think that Israelis would relate to this as, look at our muscle, look at our you know, ab abilities here, and instead they say, I can't believe we were, you know, so many of our boys and girls were killed. Right? This was devastating for them. Um, for, for Israelis, the Yom Kippur War is not an unqualified victory. It's a qualified victory. Um, Egyptian forces, meanwhile, continue to push uh, deeper into the Sinai Peninsula, but the Israeli uh, battalions manage to repulse them, and they counterattack, eventually crossing the Suez Canal and advancing towards Suez City. On the 22nd of October, an initial ceasefire that was proposed and brokered by the UN unraveled and each side blamed the other for the breach. By the 24th of October, Israel had improved its position considerably and completed its encirclement of the Egyptian Third Army and Suez City, coming within 62 miles of Cairo, which led, of course, to very, very tense moments between the US and the Soviet Union. Like this, some of you may remember that the news over here was not just about what was happening in Israel, it was very much about a nuclear uh, US and a nuclear Soviet Union. So this is really part of the uh, games of the uh, Cold War, nuclear games. Um, a second ceasefire is cooperatively imposed with the uh, strong hand of both the US and the USSR on the 25th of October, effectively and officially ending the war. Um, what are the implications of this war? First. The Arab world had experienced this terrible humiliation in the rout of the combined Egyptian, Syrian, Jordanian, Iraqi alliance in 1967. But because of its early victory, its ability to inflict you know, a very damaging wound in the first three days of the Yom Kippur War, there was a sense throughout the Arab world that 
this was psychologically vindicating for them. They had not given up the fight. Israelis recognized that despite their impressive operational and tactical achievements on the battlefield, there was no guarantee that they could ever militarily dominate the Arab world that surrounded them, the other Arab states. And so I think what comes out of this is a new conception, a new allied Arab conception. One, that they could inflict harm on Israel, but they could not destroy the Jewish state through military means. They had now tried effectively three times. 1948, 1949, 1956, actually four times, 1967, the War of Attrition, which was really Nasser's uh, kind of like constant skirmishing with Israeli forces in the uh, then militarily occupied Sinai, and then 1973. So the Arab world also recognizes it can inflict harm, it can create problems, but it can't actually militarily defeat Israel, and Israel, for its part, realizes that it is not going to come up with an overwhelming force military solution to its problems with the Arab world, which I think even as a nuclear power, by the way, which we talked about last week. Um, so out of this comes a desire to chart a different path. And five years after the Yom Kippur War, we see the first fruits of that imagination of that reconceptualizing what this conflict would look like. Um, in 1978, at Camp David, a summit was organized among then Israeli Prime Minister Begin, Menachem Begin, we'll talk about how that came to be. I'm just skimming a little bit, so like we're gonna do like big picture and then we're gonna zoom in. Uh, Anwar Sadat, who was still the president of Egypt, and of course the President of the United States who was Jimmy Carter. Um, and as a result of that summit in 1978 at Camp David, accords were signed where Israel returned the entire Sinai to Egypt, kept the Gaza Strip, which is contiguous with Sinai, and this leads to a subsequent treaty, a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1979, marking the first instance that any sovereign Arab state had recognized Israel and signed for peace. The time leading up to and including the Yom Kippur War was also a time of great domestic upheaval for Israel. Um, I'll highlight a few things that were going on that kind of provide greater context. From an ethnic standpoint, you can see the effects by 1973 of Israel having absorbed the better part of a million Jews from Arab lands. These Jews are properly called Mizrahi Jews, which means Jews from the Orient or the East. Mizrach is a Hebrew word that means the East, it literally comes from the root Zarach, which means where the sun rises. So Eastern Jews, often they are lumped together as Sephardi Jews, but that is not a name that either true Sephardi Jews who uh, derive their ancestry from the Iberian Peninsula and Mizrahi Jews, who really consider their ancestry to be Middle Eastern, accept. Right? Mizrahi Jews want to be known as Mizrahi Jews. Sephardi Jews are proud of being Spanish exiles, including like Spanish, North African, Italian. It, it blends because the expulsion of Spain and Portugal's Jews in the 15th and 16th centuries does precipitate another diaspora of those Jews. And some of those Jews, many of the Jews, find themselves in Arab lands. But there are also Jews who had been living under Arab domination and under Arab rule or under Muslim rule for generations who do not consider themselves part of the expulsion from Spain and who have their own norms, their own customs, their own language, their own foods. You know, try and tell a Mizrahi Jew that the traditional food on Pesach is like matzo ball soup and brisket and they'll laugh at you. Ask them what a bitter herb is. It's not horseradish because horseradish don't grow in Tunisia. Right? It's bitter lettuce. It's like arugula. Okay. Um, these Arab Jews from Mizrahi countries are differently educated from European Jews. They've never been introduced to Western democracy. Uh, they are, by and large, dark skinned or darker skinned than the Ashkenazim and even the Svardim. And they are almost entirely unfamiliar with the norms and conventions of. European life, which was the norms and cultural, cultural standards that were brought to Israel by 
most of the early Zionist founders. Um, and we see that this is very much linked to a rise in Israel during the 60s and 70s of a political right wing who find, interestingly enough, in a outspoken Polish Jew, formerly of the Irgun, of the uh, militant wing of the Haganah in pre-statehood days, a staunch advocate and defender named Menachem Begin. So Begin, even though he was this Polish Ashkenazi Jew, was very much adopted by the Mizrahim. As early as 1959, Begin told a largely Mizrahi Jewish audience that Ben-Gurion had sold them down the river and had turned Israel into a divided country of Ashkenazim and non-Ashkenazim. So in that moment, these Mizrahim, who saw themselves as an oppressed second-class citizen group within Israel, they felt validated. They felt seen by Begin. And Begin really becomes their avatar. Um, okay, so that's important context for understanding what's happening in Israel at the same time as the other geopolitical developments we've been discussing. I'm going to go back to now. It's the end of the Yom Kippur War. A month after it ends, not even, three and a half weeks after it ends, on the 21st of November, 1973, Israel sets up a commission, a national commission, to inquire into the failings of the IDF. It's called the Agranat Commission, and they are specifically charged to investigate what went wrong on October 6, 1973. We're going to see something like this when the war with Hamas is over. Um, everybody believes that in Israel, that there is going to be serious nationally commissioned investigation, same way there was after 9-11, to look into the failings of the IDF and the intelligence community. Um, an interim report is released in April, so it's now April of 74, and is so damning and causes such an immediate uproar that Golda Meir is forced to resign even before the final report was released, which was not until January of 75. Interestingly enough, the one person who was not a casualty of this investigation was Moshe Dayan, who was actually exonerated by the report, mostly by omission rather than commission. It's like he's not even mentioned, a fact that later draws critique from Israeli historians and, and uh, political analysts. Um, so what happens is, with the support of the Mizrahi community, Begin, formerly of a party called Herut, which had served, which means freedom or liberation, which had served in the opposition against Ben-Gurion in the Knesset. Right? Israel had only had labor-led governments, labor governments. You know, Israel's coalition, it's a mess. I won't get into how coalition politics works in Israel. That's another four-week course. Um, but Begin and Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion especially, I don't know if this was a two-way street, but Ben-Gurion hated Begin. He felt that he was a constant antagonist, thorn in his side, and Begin, by the way, leaned into that identity, really believed that he was championing voices from within Israeli society and the political echelons that Ben-Gurion did not represent, for whom Ben-Gurion could not speak with authority or acceptance by the masses. So, for the first time in Israel's history in 1977, a, um, an election, a fair and free democratic election, like all of Israel's elections, by the way, um, brings Begin and his new party called Likud to power for the first time. Uh, so this is the first right-wing government. Uh, and by the way, uh, at this point, Begin really shocks the world by announcing very quickly into his term uh, that he is going to pursue a peace treaty with Egypt. Um, this treaty had been already discussed behind the scenes. Interestingly, one of the back-channel negotiators with a, was a friendly little fellow named Nikolai Ceausescu. Anyone know who Ceausescu was? Yeah, right? Romanian dictator, the dictator of Romania who was later hanged by his people. And his wife, yeah, with his wife. She was hanged as well. Um, but Ceausescu was actually involved in back-channel negotiations between Sadat and Begin. And a lot of people have observed, not even just at the time, but especially post facto, that just as only Nixon goes to China, saying that you actually needed a strong, almost, you know, like an isolationist American president to create a detente with China, with whom 
America had no diplomatic relations since um, Mao's revolution. So too in Israel, only a right-wing, staunch right-wing prime minister like Begin could have made peace with the Egyptians because he had the credibility, right, with the people, that he was not just some soft lefty who wanted peace and flowers and puppy dogs. He was as tough as they came. Begin was hardened, and people on the far left in Israel hated him for his role in what they would have characterized as terror in the War of Independence. Effective, perhaps, maybe not. Ben-Gurion, even during the war, hated Begin and the Irguns at times for disobeying the official policies of the Haganah in order to achieve tactical aims on the field in support of the war effort. We talked about that over the last two weeks. Um, Sadat also comes forward in November of 77 and announces full-throated that he is willing to negotiate directly with Israel for peace and he says to the Egyptian people and to the world that he's even willing to come to Israel and speak to the Knesset. Um, and he uses the language, I do this in order to prevent one Egyptian soldier from being wounded. So the, when I say there was a, diff, there was a shift in mindsets, and as a rabbi, I'm, you know, I'm not actually a historian, I'm not you know, a, a political analyst. Um, I'm mostly interested in the psycho-spiritual condition of the Jewish people in relationship with the Jewish tradition and with all the other peoples of the world. That's the stuff that really interests me, and so this is sort of where I really latch on to the story. As I said last week, it's not just about, history isn't just facts and figures and what happened on what date. It's also about the stories we tell about what happened. And so if you want to understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you have to be willing to accept the reality of two different narratives doesn't mean that it's not about historical truth, particularly in my view in the case of the Palestinians. I think there's a lot that's not historically true about the Palestinian narrative, but I would say, by the way, a lot of Israelis have latched on psychologically to so-called evidence for their position where the actual history leaves open more room for discussion because history is not just something that happens, history is something that is told. Um, I talked about this after class last week with somebody who was interested in just hearing me yak. Um, when I was in rabbinical school, one of the most influential classes I took with Dr. David Aaron required that we read um, a set of articles. The shared conclusion was that the writing of history draws on the same literary conventions as does any other good writing. Right? If you're going to read a history book, you're not going to read it because it's true history. You're going to read it because it's a well-written written book. And therefore, history writers are storytellers. And storytellers get to choose which facts they're going to present and how. Right? So that's just true, but it really influenced the way I think about what it means to be a Jewish people because we have a story, right? And we're united by our story even more than we are united by his story, Michelle. You're a Jewish educator. What do you think about all this? Right. And Begin, by the way, was when he spoke to the Mizrahi Jews, um, Begin always, when he spoke publicly, he wore a dark suit and a tie. You think not very Israeli, um, but the interest, there was sort of the old Polish Jew in him, as opposed to Ben Gurion with his sort of like loosely fitting white shirts and very, you know, kind of like rumpled slacks, rumpled tr uh, khakis. Um, the Mizrahi Jews would look at Begin and say, he respects us. He has shown us the kavod, the respect of showing up dressed like a mensch. And he was the first prime minister to wear a yarmulke. And he was not really an observant Jew in the way we think about that, but he saw his leadership as an extension of his Judaism. And he felt that it was an appropriate thing. It wasn't just currying favor with the Orthodox, but it surely did. And remember that the Orthodox population is also growing, both in numbers and in vociferousness, in, in vocal strength. Okay, so Sadat, he goes to the Knesset, I'll take your question in a moment. Sadat goes to the Knesset, and he actually says that the Egyptians are willing to uh, make peace with Israel, but he demands steep conditions, among them these five. 
a complete return to the 1967 borders, the pre-1967 borders, independence for the Palestinians, the right for all peoples in the region to live in peace and security, a commitment not to resort to arms in the future, and the end of belligerency in the Middle East. This made a deep impression on Israeli society and especially on one Yitzhak Rabin, who had led forces against Egypt in the 1967 war, and he remembers this moment. Obviously, there's a big gap between what Sadat is demanding and what Begin and Israel were prepared to do at the time, but Carter tried very hard to bring them together. Carter did not like Begin. I mean, Carter is a... I don't even want to comment on Carter's post-presidency relations with Israel-Palestine, which trouble me. That at the time, Carter was willing to bring these formerly belligerent parties together, but behind closed doors, he referred to Begin as a psycho, direct quote, and Begin, for his part, thought that Carter was purposely in ignoring the enormity of the concessions that Israel was being asked to make. Eventually, though, they were able to narrow their differences. Begin agrees to give back the Sinai, but retain the West Bank and Gaza. He does not give in to Sadat's demands to give land from the West Bank to the Palestinians. And the Egyptian president gets the Sinai back by being the first Arab head of state to make peace with Israel and, by, and to sell out the Palestinians. I want to make it clear that like, this is part of the political calculus. And as usual, whether through bloodshed or peace, we see time and again that both Israel, but especially the Arab world, is willing to consider the needs and aspirations of the Palestinian people dead last and, and to sell them out to achieve their own objectives. Audrey, your question or comment. Exactly right. Right. Exactly. Um, he had... This is the same thing that I was summarizing before, that Begin had credibility in making peace with Egypt specifically because of his association with the military and with the right wing. Right? That, that was actually what gave him the ability to say, this is no longer the path for our people. Uh, and I, I think that the other thing we learn from this is that any Middle Eastern leader who is willing to uh, make peace with Israel has to be willing to be assassinated for it. Yeah, that's a harsh conclusion, but it's one that history has borne out, by the way, both in the positive for what happened to Sadat and in the negative in what Arafat was never willing to do. David. Cool. Uh, don't know. I mean, what we know today is that Egypt co-administers all of the security agreements pertaining to Gaza and has for a very long time, particularly since Hamas came to power. I said this at least a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. Is, Egypt's view is that Hamas, the ruling power in, in Gaza, if you can call it that, is a terrorist entity in league with the Muslim Brotherhood with which Egypt has a long and difficult and violent history, and actually has had leadership from Muslim Brotherhood, which is the jihadist, a jihadist organization that in part is committed to the use of violence to spread Islam as a caliphate. If that sounds like ISIS, it is like ISIS, or Al-Qaeda, and Boko Haram, and uh, Al-Shabaab, and any of the other militant jihadist organizations that have popped up throughout the world over the last 25 years and more. Um, so Egypt wants nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. Mohamed Morsi, who was the president backed by Obama briefly after the Arab Spring, after the uprising in Tahrir Square in Cairo, I think in 20, I want to say 2011, don't quote me, it was either 2009 or 2011, I know it was an odd year. Um, a Muslim Brotherhood president comes to power after Mubarak uh, is ousted, but does not last. And... Uh, Mohammed al-Sisi, who is the military dictator and autocrat in Egypt today, is a good friend to Israel in administering the security arrangements pertaining to Gaza. We'll leave it at that. But I've been to Cairo, I've been to Israel. They're very different societies. 
right? There were th- like, we took a food tour of Cairo with an incredible young woman, like so brilliant, articulate, funny, wise, but we asked her several times to comment on the government and she just ducked. Like, she will not speak about it. So there are things that, you know, that y- you can't say because it ain't a democracy. Okay. Um, so here's what happens. Um, immediately after making peace uh, with the Camp David Accords, the Arab League expels Egypt and closes its headquarters in Cairo. Sadat was actually so fearful of assassination that even after he and Begin were jointly awarded the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize, he did not attend the ceremony in December of 78. He was so afraid he was going to be killed. It happened, not then. He was assassinated by soldiers of his own army who were aligned with Egyptian Islamic Jihad on October 6, 1981. So he made it another two, three years. He was attending, ironically, the annual parade that commemorated the Egyptian crossing of the Suez in the October War, which is the Egyptian name for the Yom Kippur War. Again, more proof that Egyptians relate to that moment as a victory for their people. Even though they eventually lost the war, for the Egyptians, it was a moment of restoring pride to them and to the Arab world. There was also pain on the Israeli side, with scenes of IDF soldiers following the peace agreement forcibly extracting some recalcitrant settlers in the Sinai when Israel agreed to disengage, which presages what happens in 2005 when Israel agrees to disengage from Gaza. Not to, I don't, I'm not trying to jump timelines to confuse. I'm doing it to elucidate points that sometimes, since we're storytelling and not only learning history here, you have to understand the way Israelis relate to things, right? So when they see soldiers being dislodging settlers from Gaza in 2005, there are many Israelis, because this took place only 18 years before, of soldiers forcibly extracting Jewish residents from the Sinai, right? And Every time disengagement from the West Bank or dismantling settlements in the West Bank is brought up, the anxiety of Israel's ultra-nationalist and ultra-Orthodox and pro-settlement community gets ticked way up. We're in the 1980s. On June 7th, 1981, so this is just a half a year before uh, Sadat is assassinated, not even three months before, four months before, Israeli fighter jets scramble and destroy a nuclear reactor at Osirak in Iraq, which of course draws widespread condemnation, not only from the Arab world and the UN, but actually from Israel's Western allies, especially the French. Um, Anyone remember this episode? That Israel just preemptively knew that their, their intelligence services had provided them with credible information that the Iraqis were building uh, nukes, building a nuclear reactor. Israel's like, absolutely not. We won't put up with this. And they destroyed it. Um, and they drew a lot of, of, of heat for that. But as a meaningful coda, one of my favorite little just nuggets of Israeli lore, um, in 1991, during Operation Desert Storm, right, there were these twin operations that the US, with a coalition of 42 other nations, uh, launched against Saddam Hussein when he uh, entered into Kuwait to take over Kuwait. First there was Desert Shield, and then there was Desert Storm, and it only lasted a few weeks, but I don't know, 50 days, 40 days, I think. Um, At the time, though, that the U.S. was engaged in Operation Desert Storm, the Secretary of Defense under George H.W. Bush, president at the time, a fellow by the name of Dick Cheney, uh, writes a letter uh, to to Israel that basically says, uh, thank you, for destroying the reactor in Osirak. Sends it to the IDF with a photo of the, uh, with satellite photo of the ruins of the reactor that American uh, intelligence uh, aircraft were able to capture in their assault. I I like that story. Um, (laughs) Here's another interesting thing to consider. When, even when Israel takes this preemptive military action drawing huge condemnation from the West, from the UN, from the Arab League. Who doesn't critique Israel? Egypt. It doesn't break the peace. And in fact, one of the more remarkable stories that we should be telling about the Middle East is the fact that we've seen peace work. 
even at times if it's a cold peace. Nothing that's happened since October 7th has broken Israel's peace with the neighbors with which it has peace. Egypt, Jordan, and the, uh, the Abraham Accord nations. So it's really interesting because much of the Arab world hates Hamas right now. And similarly, much of the Arab world did not want a nuclear Iraq. Smartly, smartly. Okay, now we go to the north. The year is 1982, but a little bit of setup. So recall that the PLO in black September, in September of 71, had been expelled from what was then, you know, Israeli-controlled West Bank, AKA these were Palestinians who were operating in what formerly had been Jordanian. Uh, Lauren, I saw your hand. Hard to say, because now we're getting more into the realm of one rabbi's opinion. I believe that there's ample evidence to support the claim that the Arab world doesn't give a rat's ass about whether or not the Palestinians live or die, but needs them, needs them for their own stature and standing in the Middle East. It is much more convenient for Arab leaders in Arab states to blame all of their problems on Israel, and they can only do that so long as Israel is in this awful situation with the Palestinians. And that's why the Arab world has not really been instrumental in supporting peace efforts between Israel and the Palestinians. Norm, you want to comment here? I imagine you'd say it even more strongly than I would say it. Always, we're talking about the governments, not the people. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone heard Norm? I don't need to repeat it. Said, Israel incorrectly assessed, Norm used the word arrogance, that's a value judgment associated with it. Israel assessed that even with military exercises taking place by Egyptian forces on its southern border in the days leading up to the Yom Kippur War, that Egypt would never attack if it were not 100% ironclad assured of victory. They were wrong, the same way that they were wrong about what happened leading up to and on October 7th. And we're seeing increasingly over the last days and weeks just heart-wrenching evidence that Israel knew, there was, should have known what they should have known. This was not like, the, you know Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, says you've got your known, your knowns, your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns. This was not an unknown unknown. This is probably a known thing, that Hamas had both the desire and the capacity to inflict what it did on October 7th, and yet, for reasons pertaining to a whole bunch of other stuff, but a psycho, psychological mindset collectively of Israeli leadership, that did not prevail in Israel's relationship with Gaza and Hamas at this time. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to pause on questions, so I want to make sure we cover Lebanon. So recall that the PLO was expelled from Jordan 
following Black September. And we're going back to the early 70s now. What can I say about the PLO? <laughs> Just as they had in Jordan in the 60s and 70s, the PLO uses Lebanon now as the launching pad for its activity. So when PLO terrorists carry out the Munich attack, the, the attack at the Munich Olympics, their operational and tactical headquarters is in southern Lebanon at the time. Four years later, now 1976, Palestinian terrorists, along with German terrorists actually, hijacked yep, an Air France plane and took it to Entebbe, Uganda, where they held more than 100 people hostage, most of them Jewish Israelis, in a daring and legendary mission, many of you know this and remember it, on America's bicentennial, right? It was July 4th, 1976. Uh, the IDF sends a, an Israeli special forces unit to fly to Entebbe and rescued all but three hostages who were killed in the fighting, and one Israeli commando, actually the, the leader of the raid, Netanyahu. right, Yonatan Netanyahu, Yoni Netanyahu, immediately becoming one of Israel's greatest legendary heroes. And I think forcing Bibi for the rest of his life to operate in, in the shadow of his sainted older brother. Very, I mean, we could look at this through a psychological lens of who is, who is Benjamin Netanyahu. You can't tell that story without talking about Yonatan Netanyahu. Um, so by 1982, there are now over 15,000 Palestinian guerrillas operating in southern Lebanon. Like these are the same way in, not, not every Palestinian living in Gaza is a Hamas operative, but as of this week, there are at least 25 or 30,000 of them Right? So there are 15,000 Palestinian guerrillas, militants, terrorists, you choose your term, operating in southern Lebanon. On June 3, 1982, Palestinian terrorists in London shoot and kill Israel's ambassador to England, a fellow named Shlomo Argov. For Begin, who was the prime minister at the time, this is the last straw. He is tired and angry that Israelis are being killed, hijacked, threatened, taken hostage, at home and anywhere else in the world, abroad. And he declares in a public address, we will be no one's cowering Jew. And, and remember, we, yeah, I've got to go back to my first class on November 12th. I know that was a month ago, it was four weeks ago. But the psychology, right, of early Zionism was very much a response to the Jews who cow cowered behind the bookshelf while the Cossacks murdered and pillaged and raped in Kishinev, at least in part. And as I told you then, I'm convinced that's why my family started getting out in 1904. We have the ship manifest. And what was happening then, right? It was October 7th, 1903. Yes. Yeah, Helene. We talked about this last week as well, saying Zionism is racism. Right, and this was of course more evidence that the UN could not dissociate its messaging and its practices, its policy, from the interests of the Arab League. Right, okay, that's, that's true today. Yeah, it's true today. Um, and the UN that was very quick to propose and approve the establishment of the State of Israel in 1947, 1948, remember, had only been around for two years. It was a very different organization. It was responding immediately to the reality of the end of World War II and creating a world order that would not allow World War II to happen again. But the, Arab, but the UN of 1975, 30 years later, it's a whole different thing. Okay. So Begin comes up with this plan because he's sick and tired of Palestinian terrorism. He calls it Operation Peace for the Galilee, which begins in June of 1982. So the idea is really... Um, fascinating, and has been examined endlessly for the way in which it did not work. But the idea was that Israel would help a Lebanese Christian paramilitary faction known as the Christian Phalangist Party, and its head, a fellow named Bashir Gamayel, in its ongoing battle against Lebanon's Muslims. So what you have here is Lebanon effectively in 
the early stages, or not even the early stages, in a long, drawn-out, interreligious civil war, right? And it's in that chaotic context, by the way, that the PLO is able to operate and develop and spread terror. The idea was that if Israel could ensure that Gamayel, Bashir, Gamayel, prevails in his Christian phalangist fight against Lebanese Muslims, then Israel will have an ally to the north, and eventually they'll be able to do what Israel did with Egypt and create peace, create a peace treaty. But it knew it couldn't do that with any of the other leadership. It needed the Christian phalangist to win. The whole thing rested on his success, over which, of course, Israel had no control. Like, it, that was not a fight that Israel was able to change. It could try to leverage what it could, but it, it really couldn't do much. So in order to rid southern Lebanon of its PLO fighters, the head of the military at the time, a guy named Ariel Sharon, takes his troops deep into southern Lebanon, way past, by the way, where Begin had agreed with Reagan that the military, that the IDF would stop. So Begin, of course, you know, these things are all under international scrutiny. Israel is very much about a proxy for what's happening between the U.S. and the Soviets. So now Reagan, president, he extracts a concession from Begin. We're only going to go so far into Lebanon. Sharon goes way deeper into Lebanon. And many Israeli casualties are sustained, like 200 fatalities and over 1,000 Israeli IDF forces are wounded. Quickly, by the summer of 82, many Israelis in the street are already protesting, likening this to Israel's Vietnam. You have to remember, 1982, the, the Vietnam War is actually still a very fresh wound. And Israelis are watching this, and they believe that, yet again, their parents who promised them that their children would never have to put on uniform and carry guns into enemy territory had betrayed them. And that this was a quagmire out of which they would have very great difficulty in not be able to extract themselves. So that's the, again, the psychology of Israel at the time. Meanwhile, Arafat, I'll, get, I'll do one more paragraph and then I'll take your question, Stan. Arafat refuses to leave Lebanon, despite the PLO also sustaining heavy losses, and he exploits the situation, just listen to what's happening in 82, 40 years ago, 41 years ago. He exploits the situation by going on television showing pictures of maimed Palestinian children. And he's saying, look what the IDF, look what Israel is doing to us. Garners heavy sympathy, and he also shows evidence that the Israel is bombing refugee camps where many Palestinians are living in southern Lebanon. So with this, the war continues through uh, well into the summer, and by August 12th, Arafat finally concedes, he leaves Beirut and takes 9,000 PLO fighters with him, as well as another 6,000 Syrian troops who had allied themselves with the PLO, and he goes into exile again, this time in Tunisia. Stan. We're getting there. That's what we're getting to, right. So a month later, the Christian phalangist headquarters uh, in, in Beirut is bombed by a Syrian operative. It kills 27 people, including Bashir Gamayel. Remember, he's the head of the Christian phalangist paramilitary. He was the great hope of Israel. If he prevails, if he wins against the Muslims, kick out the PLO, Israel has a partner in the north. Now he's dead. Watch the animated film Waltz with Bashir, by the way. The Bashir of that title, it's about the Lebanon war, but it's also about the psychology and the trauma impact of the Lebanon War on the generation after and the, the people who fought as they became adults. Because they're kids, right? They're kids. Um, Waltz with Bashir, the title is a reference to Bashir Gamayel. Michelle. You have to speak really loudly from the back. You have to speak even louder. Indeed. No, I'm definitely not doing that today. 
That's another nine-week seminar course. That explains why you... Correct. It does explain what's happening today and why Iran now uses southern Lebanon as its own proxy for its own militant and hegemonic aspirations to dominate what it can in the Middle East by turning the Shia bloc, which is basically the... The headquarters of Shia, Muslim, Shia Islam is in Tehran, right? The Ayatollahs are all Shias. Their mortal enemies are actually, yes, they're the Jews, but that's not what they really care about. They really care about Middle Eastern domination against the Saudis and the Gulf states, which are all Sunni. It's amazing. Israel is really not a pawn in anyone's game, but you can't understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without understanding the wider intra-Muslim geopolitical conflict between the great powers of Iran and Saudi Arabia. And one of the things that Michelle is quite correct that Iran is interested in is building up a Shia military presence in southern Lebanon right on Israel's border, which actually threatens the interests of the West and Saudi Arabia. Like that, that's happening too. And that, there's my nine weeks in one sentence. Okay. Um, so Gamayel is now assassinated, and it's total bedlam. And Ariel Sharon now thinks that the way Israel can win this, remember, it's lost what it was banking on, which was a Christian phalangist victory with Gamayel as the new leader of the Lebanese people that it can make peace with. He believes that Israel now has the opportunity to capture two Palestinian refugee camps, one named Sabra, one at Sabra, the other at a place called Shatila. He tells Begin that he's going to go into, well, here's what he tells him. He says, the IDF is going to secure the perimeter and allow the Christian Philandrus forces to go into Sabra and that this refugee camp, this Palestinian refugee camp, and that Sharon will not hold their hands, like will not tie their hands, right? So that the Christian phalangist paramilitary can operate with impunity in this one refugee camp. He doesn't even mention that there's a second refugee camp that he's also targeted, Shatila. So IDF does not put boots on the ground in the refugee camps, but the IDF is responsible for securing the perimeter and kind of looking the other way while Christian phalangist forces go in and do what they do. After securing the perimeters of both camps, Phalangist fighters, who are very angry that their leader, Bashir Gamayel, has been assassinated, enter the camps at night. They encounter much more resistance. They think they're just going into a refugee camp. They're, the place is overrun with PLO fighters still. Arafat had left with 9,000 PLO fighters, but if the numbers are right, that leaves 6,000 still in Lebanon. They encounter stiff resistance, the phalanges actually overwhelm those forces, and in their attempt to exact revenge, they perpetrate a massacre. Uh, the reports suggest that they line up civilians against the walls, tie their hands and feet, and gun them down en masse, resulting in the deaths of seven or eight hundred men, women, and children. Now, this massacre by Christian phalanges against two Palestinian refugee camps with the passive abetting by Sharon and his forces at best, that's a generous appraisal of what happened, but that's the accepted story, generates a massive protest movement in Israel. Po protests break out all over Tel Aviv. I mean, this really looks to Israelis like Vietnam at this point, which I've said is, again, I think the, the kind of like psychological shadow hanging over this whole chapter in Israeli history. Um, it is also very disillusioning for the next generation of Jews in the U.S. If I, wasn't, I was too young at this time. I was nine years old in 1982. But I know Jews twice my age who were on college campuses were seeing images of dead Palestinian children murdered and massacred by Christian phalangists and that the IDF was implicated in it. Very, very dis dis disturbing and disillusioning for Jews all over the world. Um, the protests actually call for the resignation of both Sharon and Menachem Begin. A commission is set up to investigate, of course, the massacre at Sabra and Shatila, and it found that while no IDF soldiers were directly responsible, Ariel Sharon bore personal responsibility for the matter, and he steps down as defense minister. 
And this really sets a stage for a long and bitter conflict because, okay, here's where we get to Michelle's point. The power vacuum now is filled by what I would argue was an even worse jihadist organization in line with Tehran dedicated to the destruction of the Jewish state called Hezbollah, which means the party of God. Like many successful other jihadist movements in the region, it's not just about spreading terror. That's their military wing. You, you ever, like you read in the news about Hamas's military wing? Like the whole thing is not a military wing. Hamas also is the name on your kids' school books. And it's the provider of food and medicine, the Gaza Health Ministry, it's all run by Hamas. So it operates like a government in providing social services and goods for its people and therefore continues to maintain a grip on the population because it is seen not only as increasing, you know, they don't, if you accept that most people want to put food on the table and take care of their kids, people want competent governments to do that. And the incompetency of other governments like the Palestinian Authority has not unreasonably led many Palestinians to conclude that they'd rather have Hamas in power because at least they can get stuff done. That's very disturbing to us, but I want to make it clear, like, if you ask, well, why would anyone align themselves with Hamas? Well, there's also the fact that they're a brutal dictatorship that will kill you for being gay, right? For speaking out against the government, they'll throw you off a building. Okay, but that's not really the main driver. The main driver is they also provide all of your education, your social services, take care of your roads, your medicine. Like, that's Hamas also. And the same is true for Hezbollah. And that's why a growing share of the Lebanese population has continued to support Hezbollah, even though what we think of when we hear the word Hezbollah is the massive acquisition of ballistics that threaten Israeli communities in the north, which is also true, which is also popular, because they're standing up to the big bad Israeli IDF and the Israeli nuclear power, right? So they, it's also about pride, and it's about nationalism, and it's about, well, somebody has to stand for us in our interests. So that's how, in part, some of these jihadist entities that we view as just sort of like pure evil, that's not how they're seen from the average Palestinian or Lebanese family living in squalor wherever they're living. Yep, Jim. Right. Follow the money, right? Right. It, so who is paying for all of this? That's, that's where we really can't talk about these jihadist organizations without talking about Iran. They have a massive, well-resourced state sponsor that, interestingly enough, Iran gives money to Hezbollah. That makes sense because it is a Shia Muslim militarized operation or organization that is sworn to the destruction of the Jewish state. Hamas meets all of those qualifications except it's not Shia. It's not Shiite. It's actually a Sunni. All the, most of the Muslims living in, in Gaza are Sunni Muslims, um, which means they don't actually share the larger Islamic geopolitical ideology of Iran, but Iran is more than happy to support them because they're good for Iran and because they are willing to inflict harm on the Jewish state. So that's what they have in common, right? They have a common interest in antagonizing and hurting Israel. My enemy's enemy is my friend. Yeah, Hamas has its friends in uh, the Sunni world too, particularly in the Gulf states. Uh, it has a lot of uh, Sunni uh, Arab petrodollars, mostly from the Qataris, who by the way are sheltering a significant per percentage of the Hamas senior leadership in nice places like the Four Seasons Hotel in, in, uh, in Doha, in Qatar. Uh, for, so if you ever see these Hamas leaders speaking out, by the way, they're all saying the same thing, that they're liberating uh, Islamic holy sites from the, from the hands of the Jew. They're not saying this is about occupation post-67. Kids on college campuses and Palestinian, pro-Palestinian protesters are saying, end the occupation, that's what is the root cause. Hamas itself will not say that. Hamas doesn't think that what happened in 67 is the root cause of their belligerency, if you want to call it that. Right? Their issue is that 
land that is rightfully Islamic is in Jewish hands and must be forcibly extracted. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> I think most people who are carrying signs don't actually know what they mean, but maybe I'm being a little bit more generous than you. I, I agree with that, but, but there are the people who are running Yeah, and by the way, ignorance is probably not an excuse. The fact that they don't know what they're doing doesn't make it not bad, not wrong. Okay. Oh, 100%. Right. As Shavit says, there's ample evidence that for the Palestinians and their supporters, it may well be about 48 and not about 67. Um, and the occupation is not a call to retreat to the pre-67 borders. It's a call to end the Zionist project altogether. Right. I, that, that's probably true, but I also think that Kids don't know what the hell they're talking about. Okay, uh, let's do, speaking of what, no, Lauren, you know what you're talking about, and you're not a kid. Okay, Lauren. I consider myself a kid. I am 24. I went to university in Vermont. I have a degree in Israeli studies. I have a master's 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 in
to enter into peace negotiations with the Palestinians under what is called the Oslo process, the Oslo Accords, uh, Oslo I and Oslo II, which respectively were agreed upon and signed in Oslo, uh, Sweden, in Norway. Thank you. I was going to say it, and I was like, ah. see, I know Israeli history better than I know Scandinavian history. You'll forgive me. In Oslo, Norway, in 1993 and 1995, respectively. I'm a child of Oslo, as it were. Um, I don't know which country it's in, but, um, <laughs> but my, my kind of personal, where my Jewish story and my journey to becoming a reform rabbi dovetails or, or overlaps, intersects with the, the story of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, really comes of age with Oslo. Um, I moved to Israel as a first-year rabbinical student in July of 1995, just two weeks after college graduation. And at the time, there was still this kind of heady um, feeling that peace between Israelis and Palestinians was actually within reach. I know that's really hard for many of us now, but many of us lived through that time, and I have to ask you to just inhabit who you were and what you were then, and also understand that it was a formative time. Like, who we are at age 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, really does embed itself in a different way than who I am at 50, though I will say October 7th has, you know, changed me. It's changed all of us, I think. Um, not in radical ways. I guess my, my heartbreak over the death of Oslo has been unfolding over decades and didn't just die on October 7th. A, bi a big part of it died on November 4th, 1995 which I also lived through. So one of the things to, quote, look forward to is I'm going to share a little bit of my story of living through um, the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin from the perspective of a first-year rabbinical student living three blocks from the Prime Minister's residence. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share a lot of my own story because finally, once we get to the 1990s, I can tell you what it's been like to be a rabbinical student and a rabbi and to share what I've seen, both living in Israel and also living in this community um, here. Um, some of the other things we'll need to talk about is, at the same time as you have these kind of national efforts to achieve the long-sought peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you also have a context in which Palestinian nationalism, even as it was moving away from, we thought, from terror as a major strategy, it embraces another term, a new term, which is called intifada, which is, I do not believe that intifada is jihadist in ideology, although these days it's very hard to separate the two. The original meaning of intifada is shaking off, and it really was begun by Palestinians who believe that the occupation was a thorn in their side and was suppressing their national aspirations. And because of that, I think it made possible for a leader like Rabin to say, we can't keep living like this. Like Rabin, by the way, also similar, not big in exactly, he was, a, he was in the labor camp, but he was a hardened military commander. And Rabin was not a soft guy. Rabin had been right there in 67 commanding the troops as they took back Jerusalem. So you can't, you can't argue that Rabin was like soft on terror or soft about the Palestinians. Rabin was a tough old bird. Um, but Rabin saw that this was not good for the Jewish people, not good for Israel to persist in what at the time was two decades of the IDF basically being the frontal reality of life in the West Bank and in Gaza, by the way a position that was adopted by Ariel Sharon after Rabin. And I'm skipping a little bit, but I want you to understand that like, when we talk about what intifada meant in 1987, it's very different from the way the term is being used today, where I can't tell the difference between somebody who's calling for the genocide of the Jewish people through from the river to the sea, displacement of the Zionist project, and the word intifada. Right? I mean, Steve, I'm with you on this. That, it's, uh, <laughs> you said it, not I. All right, so we're going to talk about that on January 7th. Thank you, everyone. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>